we're very happy and uh, honored to have Abel Brodeur here presenting tonight or this morning or during the day, wherever you are in the world. Um, the fourth iteration, I believe, of the right seminar. So far, I think it's been uh, quite, quite positive. I'm quite happy with the, the feedback, I think, that the presenter so far got. I'm very happy with the presentations we had, very excited about them. Um, so like I said before, just a couple of words about um, what's the purpose of this. I mean, obviously, we were trying to sort of generate a bit of a community among people who are working on topics related to terrorism directly or indirectly. Um, and I think so far so good. Hopefully we're gonna manage to achieve that and generate a bit more sort of um, yeah, <coughs> community around the world of those people who are interested in these topics. And without uh, talking too much, I wanna welcome Abel Bordeaux today. So bamboozle us for 40 minutes, then we're gonna have 15 to 20 minutes of feedback and discussions after that. Uh, and then obviously please Continue the discussion after that if you like, over email, Zoom, or whichever way you prefer. So, Abel, the floor is yours, the uh, virtual floor. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank you very much to everybody for being here. Hey, thanks a lot for the invitation, Michael, everybody, Rafa. Thank, thanks a lot for putting this together. This is great. Um, so, today I will be presenting uh, joint work with uh, Ruben Dujante and uh, my graduate student, uh, Theodore Wright. And um, here we're really interested in the effect of conflict on racial prejudice. Um, and we're going to be looking at the Iraq war uh, in the US and we're gonna be looking at discrimination, prejudice, uh, hatred towards uh, Muslim and Arabs uh, in the US. And basically what we're really interested in doing here and before I start, please do interrupt if you have uh, any question clarifications or any question at all, uh, please uh, do interrupt. Um, so what we're interested here uh, in doing is trying to understand what are the factors and determinants of um, prejudice and what can actually fuel it. Um, and what really triggered us to, uh, to start working on this topic is a lot of anecdotal evidence of uh, discriminations against minorities during conflict. But what we thought was very interesting is cases like discrimination and violence towards, for instance, uh, the Japanese in the U.S., for instance, in California during World War II. So obviously the U.S. and um, in Japan were at, uh, you know, there was a conflict going on, um, uh, obviously a major conflict, World War II. But what we, uh, you know, what was documented, a lot of anecdotal evidence and documents written about this is that the Japanese actually living in the U.S. were suffering a lot in terms of discrimination and uh, violence. Uh, the same, for instance, for the Indian Muslims during the uh, Indo-Pakistani -Paki wars. Um, so this is something that seems to be uh, going on a lot. And, you know, here we're really interested in what's the effect of the war on terror, the, especially the Iraq war, in terms of uh, increasing or leading to religious or ethnic discriminations, especially against a minority in the U.S., the uh, Muslims and uh, Arabs. So that's really the context and what um, pushed us to uh, to work on this. And just, you know, most of you are probably aware of it. You're old enough to remember the Iraq war. Um, it's a quite recent conflict. Uh, but what is to us really fascinating about this conflict is this is really the first major conflict that is televised uh, in the U.S. And there's going to be an insane amount of media coverage of the war. And obviously the war is starting, you know, a few years after September 11th. So we're really talking about here a global, you know, war on terror. And um, for the U.S., this is a major conflict. Uh, we're talking about, you know, for the entire uh, period of the war. So starting 2003 to, say, 2010, we're talking about more than 4,000 casualties um, tens of thousands of uh, wounded. So there were a lot of um, casualties, a lot of people were deployed uh, to the Middle East. Um, and that's really the context that we're interested in here. Uh, this strong clash of civilization and the war was sold to Americans in a way as a clash of civilization. So here we're gonna be interested in what's happening for this minority, these Arabs and Muslims who are not Iraqi but, sir, but you know, are considered by a lot of Americans to be part of a group which is potentially, you know, against them. Or at least this is the way it's sold on Fox News and on a lot of media during the war. So this clash of civilization is going to be very 
uh, important here. And this discrimination against Arabs and Muslim is something that we're interested in looking at. And to be more precise, we're going to be interested towards Muslim and Arabs in the U.S. Did Americans during the war change their attitudes towards this group? And then we're going to be looking at behavioral uh, outcomes. We're going to be interested in looking at discrimination in judge decision in terms of asylum application. So we're going to have the universe of asylum applications to the U.S. And we're going to be looking at um, applicants who can be considered Arabs or Muslim, but are not from Iraq. Um, so for instance, they might be from Iran or another country uh, in the Middle East. Uh, and then the last set of outcomes we're going to be looking at is really at the far extreme in terms of hate crime, ag hate crimes against Arabs and Muslims in the U.S. And the analysis here that we're interested in doing is to look at within the war and exploit the intensity of the war. Now, how do you exploit the intensity of the war? We're going to do this in two ways. We're going to be interested in media coverage and the type of media coverage of the war, but especially media coverage that is driven by U.S. casualties. We're also going to be looking at the effect of U.S. casualties on a given day on decisions of judges or hate crimes in the following days or weeks. So here the intensity and what we're really interested in looking at is the effect of U.S. casualties and how U.S. casualties and the media coverage of U.S. casualties in Iraq is going to affect behavior attitudes of Americans towards Arabs and Muslim in the U.S. Okay. Just to give you a bit of an idea of um, the uh, Iraq war in terms of our variable of interest, which is casualty. So first I'm going to show you uh, here in this figure uh, the amount of uh, U.S. troops in thousands. Uh, and then in the next couple of slides is going to be uh, really what we have in mind, more U.S. casualties. That is really the beginning of the war, so 2003, up to about 2010 uh, when troops are starting to leave. And here, what, you're, um, what you see is the, you know, in terms of the amount of troops, um, it was always close to 150,000. So the, the number of troops in Iraq didn't necessarily change a lot. Uh, but what we do, uh, we do see is the number of casualties varies a lot depending on, you know, the year, days, uh, different types of operations. So we're going to have a lot of variation in terms of uh, U.S. casualties. In terms of U.S. troops, somewhat stable uh, during, uh, during the war. As you can see here, this, the following slide, it's exactly what I was talking about. So this is monthly uh, U.S. casualty wars, uh, sorry, U.S. casualties during the Iraq war. Um, so here uh, you see that, you know, there are spikes, so there are different operations uh, happening here. So in a given month, um, we're talking about around 60 U.S. Uh, casualties uh, in Iraq. Um, so we're going to be exploiting this variation, but we're going to be exploiting the variation more than monthly level. So here I'm illustrating this just at the monthly level, but we're going to be interested in what's happening the following day. So if there's a lot of U.S. casualties on a given day, what's happening the following day in terms of attitudes towards Muslims, uh, towards Arabs, what's happening in terms of behavior by uh, judges, and what's happening in terms of hate crime in the day or following days following U.S. casualties. As I said, this war, what's really intriguing and interesting is the fact that there was a lot of media coverage. There was a lot of interest and a lot of consumption of news about the war. And this war was really televised, meaning that there were journalists that were going to Iraq and they were showing you pictures of the conflict actually happening live and there was a lot of um a lot of media coverage of the war so for instance here what i'm showing you is the share of news coverage related to the iraq war and the um the different curves are showing you in terms of total air time so this is um news coverage at, at night uh, so think of this as the new segment on like abc nbc or cbs so this is the total air time or this is the number of uh news stories over the total the total amount of news stories for that day. So the share that is devoted to the Iraq war. And at the beginning of the war, we're talking about like 90% the first month. So basically the news coverage of the war was 
all the information or all the media coverage that the Americans were getting for the first few months. But even throughout the entire period of the war, we're talking about 10%. So for years and years and years, about 10% of the media coverage in the US was about the Iraq war. So this is really a war that lasted a long time that had potentially large effects on the way, you know, on shaping attitudes and shaping behavior towards this uh, group of Arabs and Muslims. But as I said, what we're interested in is one specific type of media coverage. We're interested in US casualties. And we're going to be interested in this because we think that this is the most salient type of events in terms of shaping attitudes and shaping the way that the Americans are going to perceive Muslims and Arabs in the US. So when we think about the type of media coverage, for instance, we're going to be doing some of the analysis, we're going to be instrumenting the media coverage by US casualties. So we're gonna be interested in the type of media coverage that is really related to US casualties. As I mentioned, we're going to be looking at three different set of outcomes. The first one is going to be attitudes. And we're going to be related, uh, we're gonna be using uh, the uh, Annenberg election survey. So this is a survey done in 2004, so at the beginning of the war, uh, when uh, George W. Bush uh, got reelected. So this is the presidential election of uh, 2004. And we have a lot of adults, thousands of adults who are answering lots of questions about the election. And they're answering questions before and after the election. And what we're going to be interested in looking at is actually a question which asks you about the favorability of Jews, of Muslims, of Catholics, of Protestants. So in that survey, they actually ask respondents, so how favorable are you of uh, Muslims or Arabs on a 10 point scale? And people can say 10, they're very favorable towards Muslims or Arabs, or they can answer zero. They are definitely not favorable towards this group. And they're answering these questions before and after the election. And what we're going to be interested in looking at is how does this change when the day before they're answering the survey, there were many US military casualties in Iraq? And we're gonna be interested in that on the favorability towards Muslim and Arabs. And then we're gonna be looking at also other groups of um, other uh, religious groups uh, as a comparison or as a benchmark, if you want. We're also going to be looking at a question which is what's the most important issue facing the country? And respondents have something like 18 different possible, possible choice that they can answer, the economy, healthcare, but one of them is going to be the Iraq war. So we're gonna be interested in looking at this as well. Okay, we're, going, we're going to be controlling for military status, the race, marital status, education, uh, a lot of different variables related to um, that respondent. And when we're doing this, so again, what we're going to be doing here, we're going to be looking at US casualties in Iraq, the day before the respondent answers. And we're going to be focusing on men because there's really nothing going on for a woman in terms of the effect of US casualties on pretty much all the outcomes we looked at. But for men, we find very large and significant effects for what's the most important issue right now during the presidential election. Men are way more likely to say that it's the Iraq war if they're answering the survey the day following a large number of US casualties in Iraq. They're also way more likely to dislike Muslims if they're answering the survey in the days following a large number of US casualties in Iraq. But we really don't see much going on in terms of favorability towards gay, Jewish, Protestants, or Catholics. It really seems to be driven, this hatred really seems to be towards Muslims. And if you look at, so the first column here just repeats column two from the previous table. So when there's, so there's a positive correlation between US casualties and a, a negative correlation between US casualties and uh, Muslim favorability. If you're looking at the standpoint scale and you're trying to understand where is the action happening in that scale, it's really at the very bottom. There's a large increase in the number of respondents who are answering zero, one, or two. Enters on the 10-point scale of how favorable are you towards Muslim? 
So there's more and more men who seems to really dislike and hate Muslims in the days following a large number of U.S. casualties. Whereas at the very top of the distribution, there doesn't seem to be a lot of movement. So this is our first set of outcomes. So just the general population, what are they thinking in terms of Arabs and Muslims during the war, especially um, here using as an intensity number of U.S. casualties? Our second set of outcomes um, is going to be about Islam decisions in the U.S. And here we're going to be looking at decisions of people who are highly educated, they're immigrant, uh, immigration judges, and these judges have a lot of experience in terms of being judges or being lawyers uh, before be becoming immigration judges. Um, and they're going to be making really salient decisions. The decision is there's an in individual who's going to flee persecution because of their race, religion, nationality, or because of their political opinion. They're going to be in the U.S. or outside of the U.S. and they're going to be applying for asylum. And they're going to be applying before the war. And we're going to be looking at decision made months later when actually they're in front of a judge and the judge needs to make a, to make a decision on whether this uh, applicant is uh, granted or not as a loan. And this is really, so if you have never seen uh, this type of decision, this is really the applicant trying to convince the judge that if he goes back to his own country, he's going to be persecuted. So this person needs to do everything he can to convince the judge within a couple of minutes that he's really suffering and being persecuted. And if the judge feels that, yes, he's really being persecuted because of his race, religion, or uh, political opinion, or, you know, potentially being gay, or, you know, one of these reasons, then he's going to be granted um, as well. So this is the type of decision we're going to be interested in. Um, we're going to be looking again in the very short run. So what happens if uh, the, pre the day before actually there's um, the decision to be made, there were a lot of US casualties. So what's happening, there are US casualties in Iraq because of the time lag, the judge is going to watch the news at night and then we're interested in the decision the following day. And here, just uh, to give you an idea, these judges are going to be randomly assigned applicants. There's a very long waiting time so from the moment that you apply to the moment that the decision is going to be made, there's one year lag on average at this point in time. So it's going to be extremely hard for these applicants to try to, you know, be at a point in time where the intensity of the war is low or high or whatever they're trying to, you know, potentially they're aware of, you know, the results that we have here. Uh, and they're really trying to play the system or they really cannot do this. The applicants cannot really play the system or trying to be, um, you know, to have their case reviewed at a given point and then they cannot control this and it's randomly assigned. So here that's really what we're going to be interested in. And we're looking at immigration judges because it's a really salient decision, but the definition and thresholds of whether you should give, whether you should grant or not asylum are super vague. Um, and there's a huge amount of, differences across judges. Some judges are going to give asylum to like 80% of applicants, others are going to give it only to 30%. So there's an insane amount of variation across immigration judges. We're going to be using uh, judges fix effects, so we're going to be following a judge over time and exploiting variation in US casualties the day before. But it's important to understand that you're randomly assigned maybe to a very, you know, a judge who is going to be more lenient or not. So and these decisions are very important. Um, so we're going to be looking at decisions from 2003 to 2010. Uh, so if you're applying in 2003, you were applying for asylum prior to the war. If you're looking at after 2004 to 2010, you were applying during the war, but your case was heard maybe a year later. The results are very similar if we look only at the applicants that applied before the war. But here we're going to show you the results for the entire uh, time. Um, so we have about 200 asylum decisions made by 450 judges who are based in different courts uh, in the U.S. We have information on um, coming from the Department of Justice on the hearing decision, uh, decision location, the judge, the date, the applicant's nationality. Uh, we have familiar with them or not, so legal representation, whether we're detained or not at the moment of the application. But we cannot 
unfortunately get more information on the applicants. We don't know their gender. We don't know um, their uh, ethnic group. What we know is their nationality. So what we're going to do, we're going to create a variable whether the applicant is from a country which has a Muslim majority. Okay, and we're going to try to play with this, for instance, you know, it's very unclear whether Lebanon should be included as treated here because a lot of applicants are not necessarily Muslim, but we don't know which language they're talking. We don't have a lot of information about the applicants. We're going to be using the nationality here to decide whether this person is Muslim or not. In terms of news coverage, this is going to be um, news coverage of the Iraq war. We're going to be using the Vanderbilt News Archive. I'm guessing most of you are familiar with, uh, with, this, um, with this data set. So this is um, basically news um, uh, from ABC, NBC, CBS. Uh, and what we're interested in is the new evening news. So this is a segment that lasts, say, 30 minutes. And we're going to be interested in the share of news that is related to the Iraq war. Okay. Just summary stats here. So 43% uh, of applicants are granted, um, uh, are granted asylum. Um, we have that uh, the asylum uh, is from a country uh, that is going to be considered Muslim 18% um, of the time. So 18% of the applicants are from a Muslim majority country. Uh, in terms of number of minutes or the share of uh, Iraq war in the news, we're talking about close to 5% of the, all the news from 2003 to 2010 are related to the Iraq war. On a given day, we have 1.7 uh, US casualties on average. Um, and here, just some information about the applicants. So 92% um, of the applicants have legal representation. We're gonna be controlling for this. And at the moment of the hearing, 23% were actually detained uh, in the US. We're first going to run an OLS. The OLS is going to be news coverage of the war on the decision of the judge. The news coverage is the day before. And we're going to be interested in interacting the amount of news coverage of the Iraq war with the variable Muslim majority country. And that the interaction, this alpha three, is going to be what we're interested in here. We're going to have judge fixed effects. We're going to also look at week of year fixed effects, city fixed effects. Uh, so we're going to be controlling also for different variables and we're going to be clustering the standards at the week level. We also try at the court level or at the country um, of the applicant. Uh, the senators don't change too much here, um, but we're interested in looking at the news coverage of the war, especially for uh, applicants from Muslim majority country on the decision of the judge. And then we're going to have a two SLS and I'll come back to it. Let me show you the OLS results first. So here, what you see is that Muslims, so applicants that are from a Muslim majority country, are actually more likely to be granted asylum overall. This is something you observed before the war. This is something you observed even before September 11. It's going down over time, but still during this time period, Muslims, so applicants from Muslim majority countries, seem to have um, to be more likely to be granted. Party controlling for whether they have a lawyer, detained, and things like this, the effect fades away. But overall, they seem to be more likely. And overall, we find that when there are news, um, more Iraq news the day before on the news, judges are just more negative the following day. But especially so for Muslim majority countries. So that's going to be the interaction term. So you see that we have judge fixed effects in all columns. So here I'm showing you coefficient and in parentheses standard errors. And here we're going to start to include more and more controls, day of the week, uh, fixed effects, week fixed effects, city fixed effects. And you see that our point estimate is not necessarily very large here for the OLS. So here we're talking about, so if you, if you would increase news coverage um, by 100%, we would see a decrease uh, for Muslim, especially uh, of minus 0.04 percentage point. So a small effect for the OLS, but a negative effect. So Muslims are less likely uh, to be granted asylum days following a lot of US casualties. Now I'm going to show you the reduced form. I'm going to show you the effect directly of US casualties on decisions of judges. And I'm going to be interacting with this variable Muslim. 
And then I'm going to use US casualties as an instrumental variable for media coverage of the war. Okay. But first, let's look at just here the effect of US casualties on decisions of judges the following day. Here, what we find is when there's an increase in number of US casualties, the following day judges are going to be less likely to grant um, asylum to Muslim applicants. And here the effect is uh, quite large. Okay? The effect is doesn't change really much when you start including more controls. The point of the size of or the magnitude of the point of Smith is quite stable. And here what I'm going to be using is the presence of US casualties. So here I'm not looking at number of US casualties, I'm just looking at were there US casualties the day before. On the following side, I'm looking at the number of US casualties. And here you find something very similar. So when we're looking at the effect here of US casualties for Muslims, um, for Muslim applicants, there's this negative effects, whether you use just the presence or the number of US casualties. Now let me show you the two SLS. So here what we're doing is first, a first stage where we're going to instrument for the news coverage of the Iraq war with US casualties, either the presence of US casualties that before or the number of US casualties. We're doing this because we think that sometimes the news coverage of the war is not necessarily negative. So you can talk about the Iraq war, but you could talk more about logistics or showing you a map of, you know, this is the Middle East, so just trying to educate Americans. But sometimes there's large operations and there's going to be a lot of US casualties and you're going to be showing US casualties and this can trigger more negative emotions towards Muslims and Africans. So that's really what we're trying to get at here. What's the effect of actually triggering more negative emotion using US casualties as an instrument? So we're going to be estimating the local average treatment effect here, of course. And the second stage is going to be on the left hand side, the decision by, of the judge, and on the right hand side, it's going to be again our Muslim Times News. And that's what we're going to be instrumenting. We're instrumenting um, the news coverage. Our F stat is over 60, so we have a very strong first stage. And here, what I'm showing you is the second stage. And what you see is the point estimates are much larger than for DOLS. And to us, it makes a lot of sense that the estimates are larger because here you're triggering very negative emotion by having as an instrument US casualties. Okay, so here the point estimates are more negative or larger in magnitude and here we're using uh, the presence of US casualties. Very similar results if you use a number of US casualties, which we're doing here in the second slide, in the following slides. So here it's again the second stage and we're using as an instrument the count of US casualties the day before. We played a lot with the leads and lags. The day before seems to matter much more than the other days. So you could think that maybe it's been, you know, US casualties three days before, two days before, one day before, and all of this seems to matter. It is true to some extent, but the most recent, so the day before is really what seems to matter or drive more um, negative emotion. Or at least when we do the analysis, this is what the statistical analysis uh, suggests. So the lag, so the day before seems to be the day that seems to matter the most. So what do we find? We find that additional news coverage reduces the likelihood of asylum approval from non-Iraq Muslim, uh, sorry for the typo, Muslim majority countries by 0 0.7 percentage points. The effect is, is quite large. So if you compare Democrat versus uh, Republican judges, so we don't know whether the judge is Democrat or Republican. What we know is whether the president who appointed the judge was a Democrat or Republican. So anyway, so Democrats, uh, so judges that are um, appointed by Democrats presidents are more likely to grant asylum by 4.5 percentage points. So here you see that the effect that we document for, um, for the effect of uh, the news coverage is quite large. It's not as large as say moving from being appointed from Democrat to Republican, but the effect seems to be still quite salient and quite large. We find very similar results for ABC and BC um, and for you know these different uh, networks. So there's really not much variation here. One thing that we're trying to exploit now is to actually look at all the news coverage um, and trying to you know code whether this was really 
news coverage that was violent or showing, you know, a coffin versus nonviolent. So this is something that we're uh, currently working on. Any question at this point before I move on to the last outcome and conclude the presentation? Yeah, can I can I ask two quick questions about the setup here? Sure. So you mentioned that uh, the 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 date the the judges were randomly assigned, but could you refuse to show up? Could you could you delay your hearing? No. Um, okay. I mean, there are exceptional cases, but it's, it's really not happening. It's, it would be incredibly hard to do this and you wouldn't want to, uh, to do that. So there's a date and that's your date and you better show up sick or not or whatever the circumstances. So it's incredibly hard to move, uh, to move your date. And uh, I mean, it's just, it's not happening. It's not happening. All right, so one follow up. Um, you, you mentioned that the lags don't matter but, um, well, they matter, but to a lesser extent. Have you tried leads as well? Because leads should not be correlated once you control for the lags of the contemporary value, right? That's correct. So we have a set of uh, specification where we, we look at what's happening, um, you know, T plus one, T plus two, T plus three. Uh, of course, you need to control for what's happening before. If you do, you don't really see much happening in terms of uh, the news coverage in the future. So this is a nice placebo that we've played with. Thanks. Okay, let me just uh, show you the last set of results uh, in terms of hate crime. Uh, this is the same time period. Um, the analysis is a bit different. You'll see we're going to be doing it at the weak level, many hate crime uh, happening in the US, uh, fortunately. Uh, so there's nothing, you know, hate crime against uh, Muslim and Arabs every single day for every single state. So. At the very least, there's that going on that is uh, very good, but this forces us to do the analysis at the weak level. So there's going to be some differences in terms of the way we do the analysis for hate crime versus judges and the entire dudes. So let me highlight some of them. And what we're trying to do now is trying to reconcile or trying to make the analysis a bit more uniform. But anyway, so what we have is um, data on hate crime uh, for 85% of um, if you will, uh, police departments. So not all police departments are going to be reporting information to the FBI, but we do have it for a good chunk of the US population. And for every single uh, offense or for, for every single uh, hate crime, uh, we kind of have an idea of like, what was the motivation? Uh, we have the number of course um, of uh, offenders, we have their race, we have their ethnicity. We also have some information for the victim, which is what we're going to exploit. Uh, so we are going to be able to look at the ethnicity of the victim. That's how we're going to be able to say, well, the victim of this specific hate crime that happened in that specific area of the U.S. on that specific day uh, was Arab or Muslim. So that's uh, the way we're going to be uh, able to do the analysis. Um, let me skip this. Let me just show you uh, the uh, well specification just for a time constraint. So here, what we're going to be doing is looking at the number of hate crime in a given state, in a given week, and we're going to try to relate this US casualties the week before. So here, the time dimension is going to be a week instead of looking at day. We look at the week before in terms of US casualties. If you look at the current week, you find very similar point estimates. Uh, but here I'm going to be showing you estimates for the week before. So we're looking at US casualties the week before, and we're gonna be interested in hate crime the following week. And we're gonna be interested in looking at hate crime towards Arab and Muslims. And as a placebo, we're gonna be looking at hate crimes towards, uh, for instance, um, Catholics, Protestants, um, LGBT population. Um, so here's the other thing that is slightly different for this analysis is the analysis is going to be at the state level. And at the state level, you could say, well, maybe there's going to be more hate crime happening in a specific state because of the characteristics of that state. Of course, we're gonna have state fix effects, but there could be more military recruits coming or more military service members coming from that state. And maybe that's why you're going to see larger effects in that state. So we're gonna be controlling for this. The number of new military recruits um, and the number of new military service members. This is going to be at a monthly level, the controls. Uh, whereas the analysis is really at the weak level, but we think that these are important controls. Um, nevertheless, we control for state, month, year, month, year fixed effects. And the last thing I want to mention is 
Here, um, this is a new set of results. Uh, what we managed to do is actually looking at U.S. casualties, but U.S. casualties interact a week before, but for that specific state. So for U.S. casualties, we actually know where the person who died in Iraq, where that person was coming from in the U.S. So we're going to be able to look at, there's a U.S. casualty in Iraq. This person was actually drafted in Texas. We're going to be interested in what's happening in Texas the following week. Are we going to see more hate crime towards Arabs and Muslim in that state? And yes, we do. Um, so you can look at just the presence of U.S. casualty, yes or no, the week before, or you can look at uh, the natural like one plus the number of U.S. casualties the week before, and we find a positive correlation. So here uh, we're using the number of hate crime also in logs. So if you look at columns four to six, uh, this is elasticity, so um, easy to interpret. Here we have year fixed effects, state fixed effects, month fixed effects, months, year fixed effects, the control that I've mentioned before. So here, when there is more casualties from your state, more U.S. casualties from your state, the following week, uh, there's going to be an increase in hate crime towards uh, Arabs and Muslims. Let me just summarize uh, some of these results. We actually find no effect for the LGBT com uh, community. We find the opposite for Jewish. So there's an increase in hate crimes towards Arabs and Muslims, but we find a small decrease in hate crimes against Jewish citizens. We also find some effects for Asian Hispanic citizens. Uh, one of my co-author thinks that, you know, maybe Americans are a bit confused about like, you know, whether Arabs are Muslim or Asian or Hispanic, but the estimates are imprecisely estimated. I think this is just noise. But anyway, so here what we're seeing is when there's a 1% change in U.S. casualties in Iraq, the hate crimes against Arabs and Muslim increases by 0.8% the following week. So it's a lot. Um, and all these, so we know the type of crime that is committed. And we find that this is an increase in hate crimes with violence. It's not an increase for vandalism. So we're not seeing people going, you know, um, more likely to go to a mosque and, you know, just write something on the mosque or something. No, we're, we don't find really this. What we find is that really at the end of the spectrum in terms of violence, we find a very large increase when there are casualties or people who are actually uh, there are victims who die or severely injured. Okay, so what do we find? Um, so a provisional conclusion. So we have a set of results showing that uh, a minority, in this case, Arabs and Muslims in the U.S., are very much suffering um, during the Iraq war and that they're suffering much more when the intensity of the conflict increases. And we think that, you know, here, you know, the first bullet point is mostly about the decision of judges, but here we managed to show you that there seems to be an effect overall for the entire population, the way they're thinking, or at least men, but it's also affecting decisions of, you know, really educated people, and it's really having an effect on the other side of the spectrum, really when we think about hate crime. So there seems to be very much a global effect of uh, the Iraq war in terms of increasing discrimination towards this group. Um, I think I'm pretty much out of time. Um, really looking forward uh, to your questions um, and hopefully we can start an interesting conversation. Awesome. Thank you very much, Abel. Well, not awesome um, concerning results, but uh, great presentation. Yes. Thank you. So any questions, comments from anybody? I got a few, so I can start. Um, one, one question: Did you did you think about a, a placebo of looking at uh, non-U.S. soldiers' deaths? Oh, that's interesting. So one thing that we're doing now is look at whether it's friendly fire or not, um, which we have, but we never thought of looking actually at you know casualties in Canada or well, Canada not really because we didn't go to your record, Woo but. Um, uh, British soldier, for instance, or yeah, we could definitely do that. I never thought of this. This is nice. Because I think that's in the same database. It might be relatively easy to do. And then you shouldn't see an effect there, I'm assuming. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, one thing we can look at is just whether there's a first stage or not. So yes. one thing that you could pick up with this is just that the operations are synchronized. Uh, and then you would see an effect mechanically. 
But if the if the if the different missions of the different allies are not synchronized, then you shouldn't. I mean, depend if there's not a first stage, then you shouldn't see any effect. Yeah, and my my recollection, but I could be wrong, is that usually it's not like on one day twenty soldiers die. So it's usually like one or two, or like maximum a handful or so. Is that wrong? That's correct. So um, I think the the point of I showed was one point five on average. Uh, so you see, you know, I don't remember what was the maximum. Yeah, so, so you might have enough variation where on particular days um, a yeah. non-US soldier dies. So but maximum no is 37. That's correct, yes. That could, be, that could be the case, yes. So you're going to have days where there's not a single American who dies, but yeah. yeah. I'm, all, I'm also, I'll, I'll just continue on, but anybody interrupt me whenever. Sure. <laughs> um, do you have you thought about looking at uh, like um, Google searches for like far right hate groups like Stormfront or such mm. as an outcome? No, we did not. I don't know how available the data is back then. All right, that starts in two thousand four. Google in. Trends, yeah. Yeah, but still, like, yeah, we could we could look at this. But what you could do That's is go to the way. Go to the Wayback Machine, and I, th I think Stormfront is actually a massive website with so much traffic. It's crazy mm -hmm. when I looked at it once. Scary, um, and and that is like the predominant, or the, the primary far right um, racial hatred website in the yes. US. Um, and you may go on the Wayback Machine. You might see how much traffic they have on particular days or something like that. I don't know. It might be worth thinking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Do you know if you get? Um... Identifier of, uh, well, you could use the IP address, I guess. I don't know if that's available. Just to locate the user and, yeah, that's that I don't, I don't But, but it, is, it is predominantly used in the US, I think. I mean, now it's it, it's gotten more global, but I still think yeah. most, of, most of the traffic should come from. Yeah, back then it was probably, yeah. 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 Yeah, this is great. All right, so can I ask a couple? Of course, yeah. All right. Sure. So in terms of the conclusion that you, you draw, like the results are great, but in terms of the conclusion that you draw, that this is racial hatred, um, should we be a bit careful about it? Because it could also be something like precautionary heuristics kicking in, or uh, it could be something like the media is now making the ideological differences more salient to people. And people yeah. are responding to that. Yeah, absolutely, it could be. Um, it could definitely be. I mean, I I, I would agree with the latter. I, I think you know, if you look at Fox News, and I have back then, like I did a lot. You really see this. They're trying to push this as a clash of civilization, really much so. So that would I would agree completely with the uh, with the latter. I. For me, it, I think it's going to be very hard for us to disentangle, you know, which one of the two is really driving it here. So I agree we should be more careful with that, that we were concluding. Uh, that's a very good point. Um, um, so one more thing. So in, in the last part of your presentation, you, you separated the casualties out by state and then tested it, um, tested its effect. So could you do something similar for the judges as well? I mean... To yeah, we could. Yeah. yeah, we definitely yeah. could. Okay. Yeah, yeah it's, it's on the to-do list. So we, we do have the court um, and there's something like 40-ish courts in the US uh, and judges don't move so much. Um, and I mean, it's hard to assign, you know, a specific court to that judge, but for most of the decision, they will. There's a bit of measurement there, but you could say that, you know, it's definitely that this this judge is coming from that state. Um, so we could do this, yes. So that was on the to-do list, absolutely. To try to make these two analysis a bit more homogenous. And, and one last one, why, what are your thoughts about why don't you see any effects for females? I, I mean, uh, I don't know. Now, now what we finish, we, we, you know, th there was a great research assistant who just finished coding information on the judges. So we're going to be able to look at the gender of the judges. Although, you know, as you can imagine, back then there was not 
that many female judges. So most of the judges are men, but my guess is we're going to find the same and people were committing hate crime or, or men. I mean, statistically, like I think I remember reading something like 98 or 99% of hate crimes are committed by men or something like this. Why is it the case? I don't know. I think, you know, they're consuming the same news. I don't think it's that men back then were men. Um, in terms of violent behavior, I think it's easy to explain, at least from a psychological point of view. I think in terms of attitudes, I really don't know why, you know, why it's only men who are, who are moving. Maybe it's because the movement and the distribution is really at the, you know, at the very bottom. If it would be a complete shift of the average and just the distribution would move, potentially you would find an effect also for women. But here it really seems to be like, you know, 10, per, 10 point scale, how much are you favorable to Muslims? Already it's such a weird question. When I saw this, I was like, there's no way they're asking this in a survey, but they are. But like answering zero, like <laughs> it's really hatred. So I think it's just because of the actual words happening in the distribution, I think. Um, but it's gonna be interesting to look at the judges. If we also find that it's really specific to male judges, I don't know if we have the statistical power to do it. I, I would think so. If it's really this, then the explanation I just provided maybe is inaccurate. And it's really something about, you know, more specific to gender. I don't have a good answer to this. Okay, thanks. Um, this this might be a second order question, but would it be interesting to look at uh, after after days like that the the coverage of um, other Muslim or Islamic events? Like let's say there's Ramadan, and how is that covered in the New York Times? Or let's <laughs> say there's a a Muslim athlete um, who's competing, and how are they covered? Like does does general coverage, let's say in the New York Times or in major newspapers? Does that change after that as well? Does that tone change? Do they do they shift how they talk about Muslims who have nothing to do with the war whatsoever? You know, it yeah. might be a secondary outcome, but it's still sort of interesting because one one project one of our honor students did this year is look at the the language, the negative emotions associated with how news talk mm -hmm. about Muslims, and it's astonishingly negative. It's crazy negative. It's it's. It's close to where like articles that talk about um, terrorism are, and and this is filtering out articles that do talk about terrorism. But when they just talk about Muslims, the tone is so negative, which is not sort of a primary outcome like your hate crimes is. But it, I guess, in the long run, this sort of, you know, feeds into this this negative sentiment that is prevalent in society. So I wonder whether you could do mm -hmm. that by looking at, let's say, New York Times articles where you have the entire length, and you could yeah. get some interesting um, content out of that. Yeah, we could. This is a great suggestion. I mean, uh, I think this would help us not necessarily tease out channels, but just showing that, you know, maybe there would be a legacy of the war. I mean, I don't know if they would necessarily change the tone the days following U.S. casualties or, but I can see, uh, maybe, you know, why not? Could be. You know, there are more U.S. casualties and then during Ramadan versus outside or the way that the Ramadan itself is, is covered in the news. That's interesting. It could be. I mean, one thing that one thing that we were not sure, you know, coming in in this project, there, you know, there's a vast literature showing, I wouldn't say similar results, but similar is in the same vein. But usually they're more looking at, you know, before and after September 11 and looking more at what's happening in terms of not necessarily in the long run, but in a period of time where identification might be less good, but you're answering a very different question, maybe a more important question. So here we're really thinking more about what's happening in very short run, but maybe we could broaden the paper and make it more about, you know, there could also be just a shift in the tone, um, you know, looking at, the cumulative number of casualties, for instance, in a given state, and then looking at the type of media coverage and how these things are changing. So this is something we were not sure whether we wanted to do or not, uh, but you know, your suggestion is well taken and uh, we'll definitely try to exploit this. Uh. Well, 
it's, it's kind of what's really interesting is is the mechanism like how does this happen that's why that first result you showed about men show the effect that women do not i think is sort of interesting because i think a literature that's sort of the the rally around the flag effect would suggest that or they are uh, you know in group out group like there's victims of us and now i'm retreating yes. further towards sort of patriotic ideas and sort of this my ideal of what the united states is and, and differentiating myself more towards mm -hmm. a potential outgroup, which might be then um, Muslims and Arabs. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I don't know what else we could do from gender. I mean, there's obviously age, I would imagine even then. I mean, we could look at, so one thing that we have now is um, for the survey and for the judges, we have, um, whether the Republicans or Democrats. So one of the things that we wanted to look at is just the political ideology of people. Uh, so at the beginning, we only had it for Annenberg for attitudes. So we're like, ah, do we exploit this? But then later on, we cannot exploit this. But now with the judges, we just finished coding it. So I'm guessing this is something we could do in general, just looking at, is it a specific group of the population or is it really a, you know, us Americans identify in a specific way versus another group. So I, I don't know how people really identify and, but I agree this is something that we could, you know, we could do much more and, and maybe this is first order, you know, maybe this is really what, what really matters here. Can I add a couple of things to that? So in terms of explaining the female versus yeah. male results, um, one thing that we know from psychology is this, desirability bias or like you know how well you look in front of people is higher in females right and uh, because of which since it's a self-reported measure it's perhaps not capturing mm -hmm. um, the extent to which they feel you know, hatred towards a certain group so so some you know some sort of a negative inverse probability weighing which will control for desirability bias because you know, we know that young people have it more often. Um, so, you know, some sort of that mm -hmm. analysis might help. But also, in a, in, you know, since we were talking about some other outcomes that could be useful, I'm wondering if you could use elections and, you know, the vote share of, say, Barack Obama won the Illinois seat around that time, right? I mean, during the war. So what happens to the vote share of Muslim candidates who are actually U.S. citizens um, during the, you know, due to this event. And, and that will give you a much more, I think, reliable measure of, you know, the, the emotions that, or the feelings that people have against Muslims. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah, I don't know if we're going to have enough, to be honest, to be, you know, to do an analysis. I don't know if there's going to be enough Muslims or Arabs candidates during this time period. Or even overall, so this, but but I agree, this is interesting. Or more generally, I mean, Michael's point of looking, you know, at athletes or anything like this could be could be a way to uh, a way to go. Again, I don't know, like if there's enough athletes from the U.S., but but I, I get your point. You know, I get I get the feeling, you know, of what you're you're trying to get at and what you're what you would like to see. So, it's definitely something we're gonna think more about. Uh, it's very useful. Thank you. All right, it's getting late. Should we wrap this up? Well, it's getting late here, you know. The sun is finally out and it's it's getting nice. Any more questions, comments? Speak now or think about it a bit longer. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, we, we could wrap it up here. Thank you very much, Abel, for, for your talk. You've given us a lot to think about. Seems like you've done a lot of work on this. Um, so look the working paper come out at some point soon, hopefully. Um, and like I said before, please stay in touch if you like. I'm sure Abel would appreciate any sort of comments by email that would be um, helpful potentially. So um, yeah. Let's, let's leave it there and thank you very much to everybody and hope to see you back in a couple of weeks then.